Okay, so now it's a great pleasure to welcome Mary Hach, who's um, our Woman in Cell Biology uh, prize winner. So um, this prize is for a, a woman who um, is within her early career, within the first seven years of starting the lab. And again, we had very stiff competition, but um, we're very happy to award the prize to Mary for her amazing uh, research that she's been doing. And we've got a very lovely medal to give you, Mary. <laughs> so. Heavy as well. It is, isn't it? <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I am actually delighted to receive this medal, and I'd like to thank, obviously, the BSCB and um, Anne and Anna for all of this, um, yeah, for this beautiful honor. And I hope I can make an honor of it, and I can give you a good lecture. And uh, indeed, yes, I, I'm so grateful that I don't think I have any more words for that. But it's really an honor to first uh, have a medal and second to have a medal for being a young woman in science. So I would like to um, start my talk by explaining you uh, probably um, what is the reason why I got this medal when I'm sure many of other women would deserve this medal as much as I do, or as, uh, even more than I do. But um, um, the reason probably for that is because when I was a postdoc and now in my own lab, we uh, started to try to develop model systems like that would be able to recapitulate human tissue ex vivo. And this is what we call organoid cultures. And I would like to show you um, how we develop these models as well as which potential applications they might have for understanding human biology as well as understanding human disease. So if we want to, um, and the reason for that is because actually the main interest of my lab and my personal interest is understanding tissue regeneration. And if we want to understand tissue regeneration, we have beautiful animal models. We have from planaria to mouse models uh, in all, each of it in its own particularity, we can study many processes of regeneration, but we cannot do that in humans. We cannot start chopping parts of the humans and then studying how this tissue regenerates. And that was the main interest for my personal interest, to try to translate what I had learned on the mouse into the human setting. And this is what I'm going to talk to you today. So when we want to generate tissue in a dish, and I'm talking not about cell lines, but I'm talking to generate functional tissue in a dish, we need to think on two things. We need to know which is the cell type we want to start with, and we need to know which is the media composition that we, it will recapitulate the in vivo scenario so this cell can be sustained ex vivo and functionally sustained ex vivo. So there is three different cell types you can start with. Mainly it's embryonic progenitors or even pluripotent cells, obviously, in the embryonic stem cells and those pluripotent cells. But this is not the cell types I, I am interested on. All our cultures are derived always from adult, what we call adult resident cells or also adult tissue progenitor cells. And using adult tissue resident either stem cells or progenitors or even differentiated cells as I'm going to show you later today. Many other tissues have been established and organoids for all these models from the lung, stomach, intestine, pancreas and then liver is, um, have been established. So in my lab and also when I was a postdoc in the, in the Hans Klaves lab in the Netherlands we developed cultures for, small, uh, for a stomach, pancreas and liver and I've further developed some additional cultures for trying to <coughs> translate this, it's always starting with the mouse, then trying to translate this into humans and also trying to translate that into uh, human liver disease models. And this is what I'm going to talk to you today. So actually the outline of my talk is based in two things, how we have generated organoids to exploit and learn about liver biology and I'm going to show you one example and how we've generated model uh, organoids from human diseased tissue, particularly liver cancer, and how these organ organoid models recapitulate the histological characteristics of the liver cancer. But I think that before starting with the models, I need to tell you about this beautiful organ, which I've been fascinated for so long now, which is the liver. 
And the liver is the only mammalian organ that is indeed truly cap capable of regenerating, at least internal organ ca capable of regenerating. You should know that actually you can cut up to 70% of the tissue and it will regrow up to its original size. The, the liver is mainly formed by two epithelial cell types derived from the endoderm, hepatocytes, which are the true functional cells in the liver. They will produce albumin, they will detoxify from components coming from the blood, they will have the metabolic glucose metabolic function, also fat metabolic function, and they will also produce bile acid. And this bile acid is released into this network of ducts. You have to imagine the liver like a tree. You have this network, which are the branches. The bile duct is a network of um, biliary cells that form like a branches of a tree. Well, the bile acid is released inside from the hepatocytes produced by the hepatocytes, released into this network of ducts, which is further released into the duodenum. And the bile acid is the responsible for fat digestion. But these two cell types, which are the only epithelial cell types on the tissue, they do not work alone. They work in conjunction with other cell types on the tissue, as in, other, in all our other organs. And these are mesenchymal cells, also um, um, blood-derived cells, macrophage, resident macrophages, as well as obviously endothelial cells. But for today, I'm just going to focus on the two epithelial cell types, hepatocytes and ductal cells, which are the ones that we can recapitulate in our organoid in vitro system. Why is the liver so interesting to me? And pro I hope it's going to be interesting to you after my talk. It's because actually, in all of us today, now, and at present, our liver is, in a no, is non proliferative, it's in, in its homeostatic state, it's in a resting mode. If you would do a K67 staining on any of your livers at the moment, you will have a hard time to find one or two, probably maximum three cells per section. And this is because the liver does not proliferate in normal conditions. Yet, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the liver has a huge regeneration capacity upon damage, not only upon resection and it can regrow, but also upon toxic damage. This, this is the normal damage that our liver receives. We don't go chopping the livers of people. So what happens is that actually upon uh, drinking some alcohol or Western diet, very high fat diet, is also very toxic to our livers and is actually becoming an increasing uh, clinical problem and also, obviously, uh, viral hepatitis and any other, uh, many other viruses also affect our livers. And this was caused, this one's caused a damage into the tissue, yet the tissue has a huge regeneration capacity and it can regenerate and, at, at completely at, and exactly revert its normal state. And you can actually not even notice that this liver has been damaged. This is only, obviously, if you do one mild injury, even repetitive injuries. However, if you do chronic liver damage, and this I'm, I'm meaning like long-term chronic damage to the tissue by any of these agents and even others that are not known, what happens is that actually the tissue this is not that it has this regeneration unlimited capacity. At some point it cannot regenerate anymore. And it either it will undergo a loss of function and tissue degeneration, this is classical of cirrhosis, or it will, during the process of trying to repair the tissue, it can accumulate mutations, and it can undergo cancer. And if I show you how the liver of a chronically injured human liver looks like, this is how it looks like. This is our normal liver, a normal healthy liver, and this is the normal of ductal cells that are present. Yet at the cellular level, what happens into an injured liver is a, what we call ductal reaction, a, a accumulation of this uh, and proliferation of this number of ductal cells, as you can see here marked by keratin-19. And this is a classical histology of any of these diseases I'm showing here, from hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis, as well as chronic liver damage. So what we are interested in the lab to answer is a, as a question is how the cells, in that case the cells of the liver, using it as a model organ, but we also work in the pancreas because it's an organ that does not have the same capacity, how the cells of the tissue are capable of regenerating and reinstalling this homeostatic state, and what happens when this mechanism change, and how this mechanism change in disease, and how this is deregulated in disease, and which new principles are imposed. These are questions we are interested to address in the lab, and that is what I said at the beginning, and we're interested to address that also in the human context, and that's why we're not only working with mouse models, obviously to address whole body physiological effects, but we are also interested in developing human models that will allow us to try to ask some of these questions in the human context. 
As I mentioned at the beginning, or a bit, just a couple of slides before, at the cellular level, what we observed is that actually in all the vertebrates studied, even in humans, what happens is that in, the, in this chronic environment where there's a senescence of the hepatocyte compartment, there is an activation of what we call a progenitor response. It has been called oval cells, it has been called uh, the differentiated ductal cells, but what it happens is actually that the di differentiated cells on the tissue undergo a partial de-differentiation. I'm going to show you this data later today. And they start expressing markers, like one of the markers we identified was LGR5, but they also express other mar stem cell markers like TROP2, EPCOM1, or EPCOM. And then these cells have what we call the B-potential capable of generating the other two epithelial cell types, hepatocytes and ductal cells. And this has been shown and proven in mouse as well as in zebrafish and obviously in humans it's not being possible to be proven because there's no possibility of doing lineage tracing experiments but um, there is the, and just by checking the histology of these patients, there is the theory behind that probably any of these cells is, are capable of activating a progenitor response and, and becoming B-potential. So, when I was a postdoc in the Clevers lab, we were very interested on this molecule, LGR5, which is a wing target gene and is a, a well-known stem cell marker in the intestine. Hans discovered that as a stem cell marker in the intestine. And then we went further and we also found that it was a stem cell marker in the stomach, which also in the skin. And, but all of these are very highly proliferative organs. And then we asked the question whether they would also mark an organ like the liver, which, as I mentioned, is not proliferative, yet it has this huge capacity to proliferate up and damage. So what we observed, and just summarizing very quickly what is, was a lot of wealth of data, is that actually LGR5, it's not expressed in the normal, healthy, non-proliferative liver, but it does become activated up and damaged. And when you do then perform lineage tracing experiment to see which is the progeny of this population, you, what we observed is that up and damage, LGR5 positive cells become activated and they contribute to the generation of hepatocytes as well as of ductal cells when we induce different uh, liver damage paradigms. So that was actually a, um, a turn point for me because what it was telling us is that we had a marker that could identify a population of cells that now we can mark this population that is proliferating. So we can ask the question, if this population proliferates in, vi in vivo, can we expand this proliferation population, this, this population that can proliferate, can we expand it in vitro in culture? So I took the enterprise on trying to isolate these cells and trying to see whether I could culture them and then I, um, because we had the background of how we, knowing how to grow stomach organoids as, go, no, as well as to know how to grow intestinal organoids, the first thing we did was to take these LGF5 positive cells, put them in an extracellular matrix that will give it uh, cues to become, um, and actually it would allow the cells to polarize. And then we gave them actually growth factor cocktail that mimics what the tissue sees during regeneration. Actually it was known when we started this project that FGF6, FGF7 actually is highly important and highly expressed up and tissue damage in the liver. HGF is classical hepatocyte growth factor, well known to be expressed up and liver damage. What we knew internally in the lab that was not published, it came on the same publication, is that actually wind signaling is also very important up and, up and damage in the liver. So when we combine these factors along with these extracellular metrics, the cells by themselves, when we put them in culture, they self-organize, they start dividing. We do, actually, we don't instruct the cells to do anything. They just directly know how to do, how to start this activation process. They divide, and then they will generate what we call, uh, in that case, is a cystic structure, which we call now liver organoids. And we prove that these cells um, are, uh, sing we can expand them long term by splitting this culture and like breaking the structure into pieces. And each of these pieces will again generate a new structure, which we call actually liver organoids. What's more interesting to see that actually not only from these LGR5 positively damaged livers, but also from a healthy liver. When we dissociate the liver and we give actually this same cocktail and we also put the cells in extracellular matrix, the cells activate the process and is like giving the signal that they have to regenerate. And indeed, they generate very similar organoids that are the transcript 
atomic level and the expression pattern, but also uh, and, the, and the differentiation capacity is exactly the same as the ones that were derived from this LTF5 positive population. And what I was trying to say is that they are indeed the single layer epithelium of ductal cells. When we have them in expansion, is indeed the single layer epithelium of ductal cells, is a cuboidal epithelium. But if we remove the growth stimuli and we inhibit notch signaling and we inhibit TGF beta signaling, this cuboidal epithelium becomes this polygonal shaped epithelial classical of hepatocytes and it starts expressing hepatocyte markers, but not only expresses the markers, but also starts having the function, it starts secreting albumin into the media, obviously not as high as fresh isolated hepatocytes, but we also observe that not only secrete albumin, that we also, we also prove that they have cytochrome activity, which is this metabolizing activity of the, of the hepatocytes. We also showed that they can produce bile acid or they can uptake cholesterol LDL. And as a proof of, but when they are in vitro, as you can already see in this structure, not all the cells express all the, these hepatocyte markers, at least not strongly. All of them acquire this polygonal shape, classical of hepatocytes, but for instance, this cell is not expressing albumin, while the neighboring one is expressing high levels of HNF4-alpha, which is a, trans a master transcription factor regulator of uh, um, hepatocyte fate, as well as albumin. So in order to prove whether these cultures, and we know now that this is around a 30 to 40 percent differentiation, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the cells acquire hepatocyte fate. To prove that indeed this was capable of functioning of mature um, into an mature adult hepatocyte, what we did was a proof of concept experiment, which was to engraft these organoids into a mouse model that had a liver disease. So we, this, this mouse were having uh, uh, were sick. They had a, a, this, a disease uh, which is called um, tyrosinemia type one, which actually is a human disease as well, caused by a mutation on this FAH gene. The mice were mutant on this FAH. When we transplanted our organoids, we were wild type for FAH. We looked for FAH positive clones, and indeed, this is one of the clones that we found. And what was more exciting is that these are true functional hepatocytes because this mouse indeed produced functional FAH that allowed these mice to survive longer compared to the non injected controls. And I'm just going very fast on that because I want to show you the new data uh, from my lab. And one of the questions we had from what I just showed you is that indeed we said that healthy liver also can uh, um, generate liver organoids. You don't need to have a damaged liver to be able to activate this process. So one of the questions I had when I started my lab is which is this cell of origin on this healthy liver. And just summarizing in this slide what it's been quite a lot of data now, we found that actually is indeed Differentiated ductal cells, these cholangiocytes, that this network of ducts that make these this, uh, branches of the tree in the liver, these differentiated ductal cells are capable of activating a proliferation program and generating these proliferative organoids that are B potential, they can generate hepatocytes and ductal cells. So actually, we postulate from uh, many experiments that I'm summarizing here that indeed this process of going from a differentiated ductal cell to a proliferative progenitor is mimicking what happens in vivo when there is a hepatocyte damage and then these ductal cells have to activate this progenitor program. So what we've seen doing uh, live imaging and, and, uh, and using the FTSE model is that indeed these cells as we knew, as I told you before, the liver will be K67 negative. These cells are indeed arrested in G0G1. They do not proliferate. Yet it takes 40 hours for the cells to enter into S phase. This we've proven that in vitro, but also in vivo. In vivo is slightly longer, 48 hours. And then the question we have in the lab is what is regulating this changing from this differentiated non-proliferative state to this partially undifferentiated, and I'm saying partially undifferentiated because it's not that the cells lose their ductal fate, they still are ductal cells, but they lose some of the, they lose, they, they reduce the expression of the ductal markers, and yet they start expressing stem cell markers and they become highly proliferative. What is regulating this process is one of the questions my lab is super mega interested on addressing, and we are just starting to scrape the tip of the iceberg. So when Luigi joined my lab, the first experiment we, we, we decided to do was to do a, a time course of gene expression, isolating RNA from very early time points after isolating the cells and putting them in culture. And what we've observed 
it was a surprise for Luigi, but I, I was convinced it was going to be like that because I knew that I, I didn't see these stem cell markers in vivo. So actually, the stem cell genes do not, it takes 48 hours for the stem cell signature to come up. So these cells that we start in culture, as I mentioned, they are differentiated ductal cells that do not st express stem cell markers. Yet, it will take 40 hours for them to proliferate and 48 for them to start expressing the stem cell signature. So we ask the question what's happening just before all of this, or during all this time, before the cell has divided, before the cell has decided to become a stem, a stem progenitor cell. And what, I, what we've observed is that there is a epigenetic remodeling with more than 40% of epigen known epigenetic regulators, 254 of 700 gene lists, more than 40% of epigenetic regulators are dynamically changing from the starting point of being a ductal differentiated cell to a proliferative progenitor or proliferative organoid. And we are following up one of the hits on this, on this list after having done a lot of sRNA screen and I hope next time I can talk to you about more about that data. But just as a summary, what we have seen is that actually DNA demethylation Active DNA demethylation by hydroxymethylation of the DNA is essential in order to allow the cells to bypass this, um, this process. But I want to move now to the second part of my talk. So with that, what I wanted to show you is how we've been using organoid technology to address a biological question, in that case a regeneration question. And I want to now move to the second part, trying to show you how we transfer this technology to trying to understand human liver biology and how we are using it to model human disease. And again, summarizing in one slide what has been quite a lot of work, the first thing that I did when I got this mouse liver organoid cultures growing was to try to establish a human liver culture system. But not a culture system that the cells are there, but a long-term expanding human culture system. And actually, I encountered a huge difficulty, and it took me more than a year to try to find out which is the right culture conditions, because mouse is not human, and human is not mouse. And it, actually, the media composition, despite it's similar, is not exactly the same. So what we found is that actually you, you need to use the mouse media composition, so the factors that we know from the mouse that are important for regeneration, HGF, FGF, wind signaling, but on top of that, it is very important for the human cells to inhibit TGF beta signaling, and it's also very important to activate cyclic IMP. And if we do all the, this decomposition, then actually we can isolate a biopsy from a donor, and a donor is someone that dies and donates the organ, and before the organ is transplanted into the, um, into the recipient patient, we got a biopsy, so this is the healthiest you can get, and then this biopsy, we put it in culture, in this extracellular matrix provided by battery gel, or BME, and then we gave this cocktail, I told you, EGF, NOG, uh, EGF are responding, so wind signaling and FGF signaling. And then the cells by themselves start dividing and organ self-organize and generate these beautiful organoids, which actually, to you, might look similar to the mouse. They are similar, but they are not identical. Like, we can definitely distinguish between the mouse and human in the lab. And more interesting, they expand long-term in culture. And expand long-term means that we can, from one cubic centimeter biopsy, we will sit through three, four wells on the 24 well plate, and one week later, we will split these three wells into four wells, um, each well into four in a one to four dilution, and we can expand them for more than seven to eight months in the lab. What was very interesting is that obviously you can think that, as I said, we don't manipulate the cells, we just put them in culture and give them these goodies. Yet you could think that they are transformed, that they might have some tumorogenic or um, transformed um, features. And we were very worried about that. I was personally worried about that. If we, this was going ever to be used to even do disease modeling, not even cell therapy, but disease modeling, it is essential that the cells do not change over time, especially genetically, they do not change over time. So we went to the, uh, in, with our collaborators, Alvin Kupen and Ruben van Bokstel in, in, in Utrecht, and we checked whether they were genetically stable. And this is only a picture of a karyotype, but what we exactly did was we did whole genome sequencing of three clones per donor, and we did two donors, and then we allowed these clones to uh, grow for three months, and then we subcloned them again, and we compared the whole genome sequencing of the subclone against the clones, and then what we observed is actually they are indeed genetically stable, there is no accumulation of mutations in coding regions, yet obviously there is accumulation of mutations in non-coding regions of any cell that is going to be dividing. 
This was very surprising. I will also again be very happy to discuss that later on if you, if you, if you are interested. So now that we had a culture, a human culture, primary tissue that we could expand in culture that is genetically stable, what are these cells? These cells again is a, is a single layer epithelium of ductal cells that we can actually differentiate into hepatocyte-like cells again, into this polygonal-like shape, hepatocyte-like cells expressing albumin and expressing ZO1, which is one of the markers of bilcanaliculi. But they not only express the markers, but again, they also have the activity of or exhibit some of the human liver activity ex vivo. They um, have cytochrome activity, they secrete album into the media, they produce bile acids, they uptake LDL. And uh, as I said, I will be happy to discuss that later on in, this, in the questions if you are interested. Because one of the things that was much more interesting to me is that now we had the platform where we could expand primary human tissue. So we could ask the question whether we could model any human liver disease. And I was very interested in trying to model primary liver cancer. And the reason for that is because actually primary liver cancer is the, you, if you think worldwide, is actually the second most common cancer worldwide, especially because in, in, in subdeveloped countries there is a lot of hepatitis, which is one of the major um, predispositions for liver cancer. But also now in Western countries, as I mentioned before, Western, Western diet and very high fat diet is becoming one of the um, highest increased risks for liver cancer, especially cholangiocarcinoma. So there was a clear need of having a good model for primary liver cancer. And yet you could say that yes, there is, and they have been very useful, a lot of cell lines especially for hepatocellular carcinoma. There were no cell lines at all for cholangiocarcinoma, but for hepatocellular carcinoma there are some cell lines and they have been very useful to answer some questions. Yet, they cannot reproduce the patient-specific features of the tumour of that patient that were derived from. Especially because when they were derived they also didn't collect any of this data. So one of the things that we wanted to do was not to establish cell lines, but we wanted to establish a model that would be able to recapitulate the patient specific features at the histological level, genetic level, and also transcriptomic level, but not on, and also even at the subtype level. And you have to think that the liver cancer is a big name for an entity that encompasses a lot, and many, many different types of subtypes of cancer. In the two extremes, we have hepatocellular carcinoma, which actually accounts for more than, around 70% uh, of all the liver cancers, and cholangiocarcinoma, which accounts for almost 20%, and the, in this 10% in between, you have mixed subtype, which is a kind of, it shares features of both and is now being more and more identified as previously identified the pathological carcinoma is becoming subclassified as mixed subtype. And actually these are very different entities and I will show you what I mean. And this actually was uh, is the work of Laura Brottier uh, together with me when we started my lab and then she got an EMBA fellowship and she could follow, uh, she could come in and finish this work. And this is what I was trying to say. So as I said, the pathocellular carcinoma is very different than cholangiocarcinoma and you can already see the histological differences. The pathocellular carcinoma is highly fibrotic with these glandular domains surrounded by all of these stroma, while the pathocellular carcinoma does not have this stroma. And it mainly has this, what they, the pathologists will call pseudoglandular rosettes. And in between we have this mixed subtype. And we were lucky enough in the lab to get samples of the three subtypes as well as, of, of course, of our donors that we get from uh, ne in the Netherlands. And we put them in culture and we asked the question, will these cells also self-organize as the donors do, making these structures? this cystic three-dimensional structures, will the tumor, or tumor cells self-organize and we will, be, will, will we be able to maintain in vitro this heterogeneity of the different subtypes? And this is what we observed. So as I mentioned, the healthy organs make this cystic um, epithelium, uh, this kind of cystic structures is a single layer epithelium of ductal cells when they are in expansion. But the tumor or, uh, organoids derived from the different subtypes of patients, as you can already see, they are morphologically very different. Actually, they are very solid structures. These ones make like a kind of a, a cauliflower or flower structure, while these ones are very solid, and these ones make a glandular. Very, they look much similar to so the cholangiocarcinomas, they look much similar to the healthy organoids. Yet, we can distinguish them very well in the lab. 
even macroscopically. What was very interesting is not only we could establish these new cultures that had this new macroscopic structure, very different, but they will be able, we will be able to expand them long term. But what was interesting, even more interesting was when we looked at the histological characteristics, as I said, this is a single layer epithelium of ductal cells, one of which is a, this, one of these very cuboidal little epithelium ductal cells, but the tumor organoids that derive from hepatocellular carcinoma, they generated these solid structures, these masses, very different between them. For instance, this one, as I mentioned, the hepatocellular carcinoma is the, uh, has this classical pseudoglandular rosette, as the pathologists will describe it, and is a way to identify the, 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 in, that this is hepatocellular, bona fide hepatocellular carcinoma. Our organoids derived from hepatocellular carcinoma also generate these pseudoglandular rosettes, these openings of the lumen, yet, the other subtypes, they, don't, they do not do that, not even the mixed subtype. Interestingly enough, we also see in the cholangiocarcinoma these glandular domains filled in where the lumen is filled by all these de dying or um, proliferating cells. So it was already um, very interesting to see that histologically we could recapitulate some differences between the, the healthies and the tumors. And then we asked the question whether actually we could recapitulate the expression pattern of the original tissue. In order to do that, we perform single, uh, we perform uh, bulk RNA seq on these organoids, and we compare the organoid profile to the tissue profile. And actually, uh, with the square is marking the highest correlation between tissues and organoids. And as you can see, not only we could correlate that the cholangiocarcinoma organoids correlated very nicely with the cholangiocarcinoma tissues, but also even at the patient-specific type, the cholangiocarcinoma line one correlated the most with the original tissue, and the hepatocellular carcinoma organoid line also correlated the most with the uh, original tissue. And when we looked at, uh, this was looking globally, but when we looked at specific markers, the markers that the, pa that the pathologists will look to de determine unbiasedly whether this is HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma, or cholangiocarcinoma, we looked at some of these markers and we were surprised to see that actually they are retained in the tissue as well as in the organoids in a subtype specific manner. So, for instance, if we focus on alpha fetoprotein, which is a classical hepatocellular carcinoma marker only expressed in hepatocellular carcinoma tissues, it was only expressed in hepatocellular carcinoma tissues as also as organoids, but not in our cholangiocarcinoma lines. And I have to say that these, all these cultures are maintained in the same media conditions. We don't change the media between them, so it's something intrinsic to the cells. And the opposite is true for when we look at cholangiocarcinoma markers. Keratin-19, for instance, is a classical cholangiocarcinoma marker. It's not expressed in HCC, in hepatocellular carcinoma. It was not expressed in our tissues, neither in the organoids, corresponding organoids, but it was expressed only in the cholangiocarcinoma lines in the tissues as well as the organoids. And obviously the mixed subtypes, they, as I said, they share expression pattern of both. So, we believe that the culture system, regardless of the media composition, because as I said, all of these cultures are grown in the same media, regardless of the media composition, they indeed retain the transcriptomic of the original tissue, at least in great part. So will they also retain the mutation spectrum of the original tumors? In order to do that, we perform whole, gene, whole exome sequencing on the tumor tissue, original tumor tissue, as well as on the organoids derived from, and then correlate it the, the mutations that we found in the tumor tissues with the uh, organoid mutations that we found in the exome sequencing. And actually we found 84% of the cancer-related somatic variants, they are present in the organoids that were already present in the tumors. And when we look at all somatic variants, the correlation is up to 90%. But when we look at the cancer-related somatic variants, we see that actually we cannot retain around 20% of the, of the somatic cancer somatic variants that were on the tissue. We don't capture in our, in our culture system. But what it was more interesting for us is that actually we look at the organoid-specific mutations. We actually do not acquire any no, the novel mutation just because of putting them in culture. As you can see, there is no, almost being only for one one or two mutations for cholangiocarcinoma line one. So, the conclusion of that is that yes, we do not actually capture all the mutations that were present on the tumor, could be also difference on the in depth, but probably we do not capture them, but more interesting, we do not, gen we do not generate the novel mutation. So whatever, it, whatever they expressed, whatever they had as mutations originally, we retain most of them in culture. And as one of the last proof of concept or, or gold standard experiment was to transplant this 
into a mouse model to prove whether actually after this long-term expansion in culture, we would still retain this histological characteristic. I told you we didn't want to generate 2D cell and we didn't want to generate cell and we wanted to generate an um, um, in vitro model that would recapitulate the features of the original patient. So this has to also be recapitulated after long-term expansion. So we wanted to know whether actually after long-term expansion the cells will, and you transplant them in vivo, the cells will be able to reorganize into another tumor that will generate very similar structure than the original one. So that's why we perform this experiment. We grow uh, our, uh, so most of our lines in culture for more than three months and then we transplanted them. Some of them were grown for almost half a year. And then when we transplanted them spontaneously into an immunosuppressed mice, immunosuppressed mice and then we looked at organ uh, tumor formation. And this is one of the lines. This is a cholangiocarcinoma line one. And we observed the formation again of this glandular domain surrounded by all of this stroma, which was very surprising to us. But even it would be more surprising if I now show you this was the tumor that grown in the, in, in, the pe in the mouse. And this is the tumor that came from the patient. The biopsy that we got that generated the organoids that generated this tumor after transplantation. And actually when we showed that to the pathologist, she said that she could not distinguish which was which one, which was the one generated on the mouse or which from the one generated on the, on the, uh, that was from the patient. So what I'm trying to convey to you, and this was the work of Laura together with a very talented PhD student Gianmarco and the help of our research assistant in the lab, what I'm trying to convey to you is that um, after long-term expansion, the cells still retain the memory of what they were when they were on the tumor as far as you culture them in an environment that mimics the tumor environment. So, so now that we had a model that could recapitulate most of the features, I'm not saying all, but most of the features, especially of the tumor part of, of the tumor, what can we use it for? Because if you have a model that is not useful because it's very difficult to work with or because it's not reproducible or whatever, then it's, at the end it's not useful. So we, we actually we proved that it, we, could, we wanted to know whether it could be helpful to understand part of liver cancer biology and that's why we asked the question whether we could identify novel biomarkers for liver cancer using this model and we wanted to ask the question whether we could use it to identify new drug sensitivities. So to try to identify, to try to ask the question whether we could identify novel genes in liver cancer using, so using this organoid technology, could we identify novel genes that could have a potential role for liver cancer that had never been described before? In order to answer that question, um, this actually came more like as a, as a just trial and error. What we did here, we collected all our RNA sec data from all our tumor organoids and we subtracted the healthy organoids and we generated what we call a tumoroid, tumor organoid signature. And we interrogated this tumor organoid signature, we asked the question, is it this relevant at all? If it is, a way to ask this question would be to go into a large cohort of patients, in that case we took TCGA cohorts uh, from HCC as well as cholangiocarcinoma and then we ask the question if this is a really a relevant tumor signature it, most of these genes should be overexpressed in these uh, primary liver cancer populations and not only that but maybe if we are lucky maybe we are capable of identifying maybe novel prognostic biomarkers by just looking at survival curves and this was just using <coughs> our RNA-seq data and publicly available data sets so we did that and we just took our, third, our top 30 gene list and looking at the top 30 gene list was already very surprising. We already identified 12, 12 genes that were already described to be important in liver cancer and had prognostic value. Prognostic meaning that when they are overexpressed they have, and the patient has poor prognosis. But then we also find 11 genes that had never been described in liver cancer. And we were very interested on these 11 genes. What are these genes? What are they telling us about liver cancer at all? So when we interrogated this 11 gene list into the TCGA cohorts, we actually find, except one of these genes and in IPSAC for the hepatocellular carcinoma cohort, all the others were overexpressed, significantly overexpressed in the, the, in the TCGA hepatocellular carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma cohort compared to the healthy. And this is an example of stamina one. And then we ask the question, Okay, so we, they are indeed overexpressed, so they, indeed they are relevant in these patients, these genes that we find that have never been described in liver cancer, they are overexpressed in liver cancer cohorts, but also five of them 
they already were capable of predicting poor prognosis for these patients. And just I'm showing you again two examples where actually when the gene is overexpressed, the C1QB, when she is it overexpressed, the patients have significantly poor prognosis as well as C19ORF. For TDA, actually, these were two of our, the top, top, this was the top two on the, on the gene list. These genes already describe poor prognosis for these patients. So we think that actually we can use this, this technology not to, um, to complement, not, not to supplement, but to complement uh, what it's been done at the, um, in obviously in huge efforts on, on mouse gen in, in geneticists to try to identify potential novel genes that might have a potential role in liver cancer. <coughs> obviously to know whether these genes have indeed a role, in, uh, further studies will need to be done. And as I said just in the last um, two slides of my talk, I want to show you how we've also been using this technology to address what it is a quite more an obvious question about identifying potential new drug sensitivities. And in order to do that, we collaborated with Matthew Harnett and Hayley Francis at the Sanger Institute. I mean, two fantastic uh, persons, fantastic collaboration. They had the, already in their pipeline a beautiful amount of very well-known anti-cancer drugs. They actually, they, their, uh, Matthew's lab is, is um, well known for being able to perform large drug uh, screenings in cell lines, with many, many cell lines. And we ask, with Matthew, we asked the question, can we use our organoid technology for drug screening? Because actually these are three-dimensional structures. We, we don't make them single cells. We, they don't like to be single cells. We can do it, but they don't like it. And it was not something we wanted to do because actually our tumors are not single cells. They are growing in a 3D structure. So making a drug screening on a single cell level makes no sense, at least in my mind. So, we are, but we didn't know whether it would be possible to use this technology in a robotic um, platform because it has the material. It, 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 it. And then actually Matthew and, and Haley um, worked very nicely in collaboration with us and they set up this technology together with Laura and then we screened 29 uh, well-known anti-cancer approved drugs that they had in their pipeline and you have a summary here and much to our surprise <laughs> But maybe it should not be our surprise. Actually, most of the lines are resistant to almost everything. In white, you have resistance. And you can see that actually most of the lines are resistant to almost all the drugs that we tried. We have one line that was resistant to everything. Yet, obviously, we found some sensitivities. And we ask, obviously, this was a screen done by a robot. The cells were seeded by a robot. The drug was added by a robot. We wanted to know whether that was not an artifact. That was a five-day experiment. Uh, just measuring luminescence and viability. So we wanted to know whether that was indeed uh, capable of being reproduced in the lab in, in a hand-based experiment. So Laura took five of these drugs marked here in yellow and she performed the same experiment but in a different way with a completely different readout. He, they, in the other experiment, Matthew was reading out uh, luminescence from the ATP, from this um, um, viability assay. Here we re we, our readout was organoid formation. We, we generated um, all, for all these lines, uh, Laura treated them with all these drugs and then what we observed is that actually for all of them, except for this one that has the asterisk, for all of them the, there was a perfect match with the drug screening platform, indicating that indeed actually what we had found in the drug screening was very reproducible in the lab. And then we were very much interested on this compound which is an ERK inhibitor and the reason for that is actually because it should a very strong effect on the drug screening, a very strong effect in the lab. I mean, there is no organoids whatsoever growing here, but not in all the lines. Some lines are still resistant. So we asked the question, um, and then we knew that this compound, despite ERK has been predicted by Jessica Zugman Rossi, a fantastic geneticist in Paris, a liver geneticist, uh, it had been predicted that probably is a good target for liver cancer because actually uh, liver cancer is devoid of ERK mutations. Nobody had tried ever liver, uh, ERK inhibitors in liver cancer and we were surprised about that because it's not used in the clinic either. And then we, but it, the, 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 answer, the result was so striking that we asked the question, well, is this indeed relevant in vivo? It can inhibit also uh, tumor formation in vivo. So what we did was the next experiment was to generate tumors from some of these lines and we are still repeating these experiments on other lines at the moment. And then when the tumors were 100 millimeters volume, so some, a mass that you can detect uh, and you can measure, 
we lower injected them with this compound and then we follow up and then I would actually what we saw is a complete regression of the tumor and this is actually after looking at the histology analysis of the tumor they were all tunnel positive apoptotic cells in the tumor while actually the vehicle treated ones they grow beautifully into these glandular domains. So with that I'm getting to the summary of my talk and what I'm trying, I'm just going to um, go back to what I was the first part of my talk, I was trying to tell you that indeed we can take a damaged liver and isolate cells, in that case LGO5 positive cells, and now we know that we don't need to do that with a damaged liver, we can do it with ductal cells from a healthy liver, put it in culture and differentiate them and transplant them back into these FAH mutant mice and I've also told you that when we start with from a healthy liver, the activation of the process is dependent on this epigenetic regulation which in part is mediated by DNA hydroxymethylation in specific stem cell genes. And from the second part of my talk, what I've told you is that indeed we can take human liver tissue from a healthy donor, from a tumor a patient, and then we can expand it long term in culture. When it's healthy, we can, uh, they are genetically stable. When there is a tumor, we also retain most of the mutations of the original tumor biopsy. And more interestingly, probably we can use them to predict um, drug sensitivities and <coughs> maybe potentially for personalized medicine. And with that, I'm actually arriving to the most important slide of my talk, which is actually the acknowledgements. I would like first to acknowledge, it's not in that slide, I just noticed, but I would like to acknowledge Hans Clevers because he has been a fantastic mentor. And uh, he gave me the opportunity to do a postdoc in his lab, which uh, allowed me actually probably to be here today and receive this beautiful medal from you. And obviously, I would like to thank the people in my lab, especially Laura Bertier. She was um, essential, a fantastic fellow, uh, helping on the um, liver cancer project. Luigi, uh, she worked in collaboration with other people in the lab. Luigi uh, Aloya, who is the person that has been working extensively on this other uh, project, trying to understand how, uh, which is the gene regulation of these ductal differentiated cells into the undifferentiated progenitors. And he's working very closely together with the PhD student, Michael Mackay. Obviously, I would like to thank my collaborators and funding. And I want to take one 30 seconds more to just give an extra acknowledgement, which I would not do if I would not have, because I received this medal. So um, I would like first, obviously, to acknowledge uh, BSCB for, for, for giving me this opportunity. This is, this is fantastic. But I would like to thank this person here, which most of you might know, Pro and Professor Anna Philput. Actually, I feel very close to her because she has been my true mentor uh, since I started my, my own lab. Uh, we actually don't work together, but actually she has been, been giving fantastic advice and and I, um, I think she, um, she's uh, someone I really, really uh, would like to thank for all this time in, in Cambridge. And I would like to thank some other people, which is actually my family, which uh, without them, actually, I'm sure I would not be here, here today, but no way. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Very intriguing talk, um, but I'm mostly interested in the basic research enterprise bit, where you had um, cells which are becoming more proliferating, mm -hmm. um, and you did a nice heat map of uh, epigenetic screening, and you've identified 250 or so mm -hmm. uh, out of 700. I was just wondering, would you like to share with us what are some of the uh, subclusters of genes there yes. that are gene products that are involved in this. Uh, I mean, are there cell cycle regulators? Are there cytoskeletal proteins, etc.? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I can share that. Absolutely. So, um, in that case, we focus. Um, we were just looking at epigenetic modifiers. Um, we've seen a lot of metabolic genes, but so some of the epigenetic modifiers that we saw, for instance, we saw many proteins involved in the SYSNF complex. They are changing dynamically very quickly. The TET family members, the two of the three, TET1, TET2, which is one of the hits we are pursuing at the moment, uh, they change, they, they dramatically peak at 24 hours and then they go back to its basal state. And this 24 hours is a window we are very much interested because it's just prior to the stem cell signature, this 40 hours initiation of the stem cell signature. And what we've seen is that actually these TET um, um, enzymes, these are 
Um, uh, these are uh, proteins that will oxidize the methylcytosine into hydroxymethylcytosines and then it facilitates transcription. And actually we've seen that actually hydroxymethylation in the stem cell genes like LGF5 occurs prior to LGF5 expression and it is required for expression. It's, not, it's necessary but not sufficient, but it's real. Yes. So this would be some of the hits that we found on, that, on our screen. Yeah. Okay, can I ask you a question? So, um, to what extent are liver cancers um, exist in subclones within our patients, and are you isolating just single subclones when you do the organoids? Absolutely, fantastic question. Um, we still don't know that fully. Um, so, liver cancers, they obviously, as all tumors, they, there is heterogeneity, intratumoral heterogeneity. We are looking into our organoid intratumor heterogeneity as well, using single cell RNA seq in that case. We see, um, we retain some of the, we, I don't know whether we retain some of the uh, clones that were originally on the tumor, but what we do retain is hierarchy on the structures. So we see uh, cl clusters of cells that are proliferative and clusters of cells that are fully differentiated and that we are starting to see that we can, they cannot generate in the novel structures. Like is um, like this hierarchical um, structure. Yet we think that we can fine tune this, and then we could probably take some of this differentiated population and bring it back into a more proliferative state. Whether we could, whether we recapitulate all the clones that the tumor patient had, I think probably not. But it's true that we don't have evidence either in favor or against. Probably this is this twenty percent that we cannot capture. Probably it's coming from there. So you show that really nice karyotype, and I think you wanted to say something about the karyotype, right? Because aren't, aren't liver cells often aneuploid? Isn't there a lot of aneuploid in the liver? So it's kind of interesting. So do you want, can you say something about that? Absolutely, yes. So um, the beautiful karyotype I showed is because uh, it's... it's um, so our, uh, the, the cells that expand the culture are diploid. And the polyploid cells in the liver, they are the hepatocytes, the fully mature hepatocytes. So what we see is that in the expansion conditions, we don't have we all the cells are deployed. So in the case of the mouse, 40; in the case of the human, 46. But when we differentiate them, we do see the appearance of, but it's always either um, active or uh, so tetraploid, but always n not aneuploidy. But um, either from diploid we go to uh, tetraploid, or so they have 80 chromosomes. Or something. So we see that after differentiation, yes, but not in the expansion phase. The expansion, the, the cells that expand the culture, they are deployed. And it's funny because it's something that I find super interesting because um, whenever we get, I think whenever they get an aneuploid cell, this is only on the healthies. The tumor is a different story. The tumor is very aneuploid and it's maintained by the aneuploid cells. But when they are healthy, the cells that maintain the culture, they need to be the, these deployed cells because whenever we got an aneuploid cell, uh, let's say, and then we did a late passage, then we don't find them back. So that's something I found. So somehow they have an intrinsic mechanism to maintain the genetic stability, which is something that it was uh, Hans already uh, has seen, and Hans and Edwin Cooper have already seen in the intestinal organoid and intestinal stem cells in vivo as well. So something intrinsic to the, to the property of the cell, which is very interesting. Okay, thank you very much, Mary, for your lovely talk.